Forgive me, Father, for I have died. It has been, uh, I don't know how long since my last confession, but after the accident, it's all just been, it's kind of in limbo. You know, I can't wrap my head around this, this aftermath. It just seems so unreal. And there are a lot of people like me here. It's kind of like a big lobby or a waiting room. No one seems to talk much. And then there are others. They try to help us move on, I guess. But I notice there's free will. Still, (laughs) even in the afterlife. But the thing is, Father, what I've realized is sometimes we create our own hell. I guess my point is that these others, they they keep telling me that we should talk, you and I. And so, well, here I am. Oh, yeah, and I, I almost forgot. This isn't a dream. It's Kyle. In a world where nothing is known, nothing is certain, Reality is not real. Wake up! Be afraid of nothing. I'm Bob Heskey. Robert. The host with the ghost. This is my podcast, based on my paranormal documentary, Afraid of Nothing. Each episode, we talk to people who see life and the afterlife through a different lens. Join me. Who is this large man? And what's he doing in our bedroom? As we lift the veil and open our minds to see beyond our eyes lie. This is Afraid of Nothing. Nothing. Tonight's guest is Father Nathan Castle, who claims he has helped at least 250 people who died suddenly or in a violent death adjust to the afterlife. In his own words, Father Nathan says, I believe we are eternal. I believe the Creator who made us loves us wildly, beyond belief. My mission is to help people live in the present, feel loved, and dwell in joyful hope. As a Catholic priest, I specialize in helping those who feel stuck, whether in this earthly life or in the afterlife, experience freedom. This is how Jack Canfield, author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, describes Father Nathan. Nathan Castle is a Catholic priest. Catholic means universal, he says, and he hopes he can help anyone in the universe to be happy and free. The work he describes in Afterlife Interrupted, helping souls who died dramatically get unstuck, is fascinating. It has touched me at a very deep level. One of the things I take away from this is that we do go on. We don't stop existing just because we dropped our bodies. The author of Afterlife Interrupted, Helping Stuck Souls Cross Over, Books 1 and 2, and also Toto 2, The Wizard of Oz as a Spiritual Adventure. Father Nathan can be heard on many podcasts, and his website is www.nathan-castle.com. That's www.nathan-castle.com. I am here with Father Nathan. Father Nathan, thank you for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Great to be with you. Yeah, so today we're doing the interview on November 1st, which is All Hallows Day or All Saints Day, which is right after Halloween which seems appropriate for this. Did you have any visitors in your dreams last night? I think I had one the night before, but not last night, not on Halloween night. No. The last time we talked to you, the Red Sox were up over your beloved Astros two games to one, but through some sort of divine intervention, the Strohs won the next three. And so congratulations on the World Series. You guys were behind by one game, but I'm I'm actually rooting for you. So uh, good luck tomorrow night with the Astros. You mentioned last night I was I was up late watching that game and uh, trying to, you know, get it across the finish line. Even with a lead of what they had nine to five, I think still it's kind of nail biting when you're when you could lose the game and that's the season. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, you know it's uh, they have been a comeback against the Red Sox. It's a very good team, so uh, I'm rooting for them. It's it's a good it's a good group of players. 
All right, we're going to get into the interview then. So, so you are a pastor and a Catholic priest. What's the difference between the two? And do you mind giving us, you know, as a setup, kind of what's your religious training? Sure. Well, actually, I'm not formally a pastor. I have been for much of my life. That pastor is really a specific job description. Not every priest is a pastor, but I have been a pastor of four different communities at different times, always as a campus ministry pastor. I've always worked on universities. And right now I live at the University of Arizona, but I'm not formally a pastor anymore. Uh, I'm doing full-time work in writing, retreat directing, teaching online. And the topic that we'll be talking about today, the afterlife, is largely uh, what I'm focused on. And how did you get into it? Is it? Was it in college or when did you know you were going to do this following, religious following? Well, I was born into a, an, an active practicing Catholic family and educated in really good Catholic schools that gave me a cosmology, gave me a whole worldview of why I'm here and how things work and purpose and destiny and including life after death. I always just, that was my worldview. As I grew up, understood that other people have lots of different ways of thinking about life and purpose, but this suited me really well. So it's really kind of been a part of me all along. You believe in guardian angels and that we all have one. Absolutely. And I actually, you know, I listened to you on a, a couple of different interviews and podcasts. I actually asked mine to be with me on this interview tonight, even though I'm not sure what its name is. I think you know your guardian angel's name. Can you explain, you know, who guardian angels are, what they are, what type of beings, and why they are attached to us? Yeah, in, in the cosmology that I've been given, there are three kinds of persons, divine persons, angelic persons, and human persons. In the Catholic Trinity, uh, understanding a Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are different persons within the one God. Then the angels are a different kind of person. They're immaterial, but they share with us intellect and will and freedom and love. And then there's us, the humans. Others now begin to open a category toward animals, animal personhood or consciousness. Uh, but that was the classical three is what I was taught as a child growing up. The angels are, are wonderful. That Each of us does come into this life with one. I think God knows that this is a dangerous place, or can be. It's beautiful, but it also has dangers. So we're sent with a companion. Our guardians are have been with us every moment since our conception. So they are great knowledge bases for anything about you that confuses you. I, I sometimes go to my guardian and say, what's this all about? Or can you help me? Can you be with me in something perplexing? They're just great companions. And they're, they'll be with you all the way to your death and through it. Is it just with this lifetime? Do you have a new guardian angel every, I, I think you believe in different lifetimes that we go through. So if I'm making that I, uh, leap of faith, I guess, but are they with us just in this lifetime or are they recycled with us with every lifetime that we go through? Well, about my own uh, idea on past lives or reincarnation and so on, I try to stick with what I've been taught and that's that I have this one life. I don't know if I've been incarnated before. If not, <laughs> if I have, I'm unaware of it. I know there are a lot of people that work in past life regression and stuff, but that's just uh, not my field. I believe I came here with this guardian and he'll be with me until his services are no longer needed after I pass. He'll still love me. I'm saying he, they don't have gender naturally. They don't have bodies that have cells or genitals or DNA markers to, to define their gender. But mine manifests more as masculine than feminine. Uh, it goes by the name Philip James of the line of Michael. And uh, he's really cool. Sometimes you hear a voice in your head or an intuition. Is that them or speaking to us? Or You know, I, I suppose everybody would answer that question different. Everybody that loves an angel. I hear mine most particularly when I'm about to forget something important. You do ever start running errands. You're going to go to the dry cleaners, but the dirty clothes are on the end of the bed. Yeah. That, that, <laughs> that kind of stuff where I'm just, I, oftentimes I'm trying to do too many things at once. I'm mentally uh, multitasking, and he's really good at saying, remember the car keys, they're over there. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, I, I like I said, I've been got your first book, been listening to it, and a couple podcasts. I heard somewhere along, along the line that every night before you go to bed, you say a, a prayer to free your consciousness to do uh, good deeds. It's called a compline for like for complete. I think you described it. Yeah. Uh, because when you're sleeping, you figure you don't need your consciousness, right? So, how do you make sure that your consciousness ends up with the right hands and isn't intercepted by any kind of not so nice entities? Is it the prayer that you say before before bed that that ensures that, that it goes into only 
positive divine beings? Well, remember, I'm a Roman Catholic priest, and so I, I pray according to our customs and, and uh, language and so on. Primarily, I make the sign of the cross over my body. I believe that that secures the, ne- the line. You know, I'm talking to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the body of Christ, and to no one else. Then I say, thank you for giving me a consciousness at all. Thank you for the events of the day winding down now and preparing to go unconscious. So would you hold on to my consciousness until the morning? And if there's anything that you can do with it in the meanwhile, please feel free. And so one night about 23 years ago, something different happened than any time before you said that prayer. So you want to tell us about that night? Yeah, I was uh, on a retreat. I live in Arizona and and I did at that time also. Uh, In in the north of the state, it's mountainous and uh, there's a lot of camps when we would go on retreat with any kind of groups that usually meant driving to the north to the piney part of the state. I was on a retreat with a bunch of other people, friends of mine. I was part of giving the retreat. Uh, and during the night, I was dreaming about playing golf, which is something I do. And I was playing with another priest friend in the in my dream. We finished our round of golf. We went into the bar. And in the bar, there was a silent auction going on. Have you been to one of those? Yeah. Yep. You know, walk around the room and you write down how much you pay for this or that thing. And then across the room, there was this nasty piece of framed art that was just horrible from a distance. And I said to my friend, who in the world would donate that to a charity? They ought to be ashamed. (laughs) But it was so compelling. I walked toward it. And when I did, it moved toward me. And it was long before we had televisions on our walls, but it was sort of like that. It, It was a piece of framed art on the wall, but it moved toward me. And then inside the frame, there was a little movie running. You want to know it was in it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just sorry. I was listening. Oh my God. <laughs> I, I was looking at a guy sitting on the radiator of an old car from the late 50s or 60s, the kind with fins and lots of chrome. He wasn't in a wreck. He was more like a repair guy, you know, grease monkey. Yeah. And he had his feet on the bumper and he was sitting on the radiator with the hood open above him and he burst into flames and was screaming, and he was angry at somebody outside the picture frame to the lower right where an artist's signature usually is. Yeah. I woke up from it going, wow, the first part was my dream, but the second part wasn't. I knew that that was somebody else's content, and I sat up and I said a prayer. said, hello, my name is Nathan, whoever you are. I I get it that you're, you're calling out for help. I'll see what I can do in the morning. In the meanwhile, God bless you, and I'm going back to sleep. Well, good for you to be able to go back to sleep. That's amazing. Well, that's what I did. So I got together with a prayer partner who was on the street, and I knew that she was a spiritually gifted person because I had prayed with her for a number of years. I just said, I don't know what this is. Would you mind praying with me? And we got still and went into prayer. And uh, she said, well, whoever it is really wants to talk to you really badly. Would it be okay if I let him? And she had the the uh, spiritual gifts to do that. And so I said, well, we've, we've called on Michael the Archangel. We've asked for our own guardians. We asked for Holy Mary and St. Benedict. And anyway, a whole bunch of saints. Today's All Saints Day. But I create sort of a holy huddle and just say, no one outside the light is invited here, but we want to allow this man to talk. And he did. He explained who he was through my friend. And I asked him how we could help him. Was your friend conscious? Did she did she know what was coming out of her at the yeah. time, but she was just kind of coming out yeah, of her? Yeah, she was, she was conscious. And I had witnessed yeah. her manifest that gift before. And I had that gift also. I hadn't manifested it very frequently, but once in a while, a, an occasion would come up when it just happened. And so I you know, went with it. Was this instinctive? Did you know what to do after the dream? You said, you know, I'm going to go back to sleep, but I'm going to make notes, I guess. And you called your friend. Did she tell you what to do? Did you know what to do instinctively? Did it just kind of evolve? You know, like when we're born, we're like, we're in the mother's channel and we're like fish. And then when we come out, we can breathe all of a sudden. Did you just like know what to do all of a sudden? Well, I don't know. I, I, you, you and I have not met except over, you know, uh, email and online. Yep. Uh, but you sound sort of commonsensical. Would you say that you're a practical guy? Yes. I don't know if other people always say that, but yes, I would. And of course, you have this odd interest in all of this stuff, but that doesn't mean that you can't be a problem solver, that you just can't look at a thing and decide what to do next. Yeah. Like he was coming to me and to my partner asking for help. And I do, I've done pastoral counseling my whole life. So when, when somebody new comes into your office, makes an appointment, 
as soon as you get comfortable, pretty much the first thing you say is, how can I help you? What is it you want? And that's what we did. And was it one session or how many sessions did it take to help this, this person? We took maybe three. I'm not exactly sure. I tell this story over and over again. I think it was three, four tops, about maybe about a week apart. We were both really busy people. And just the fact that you have some paranormal thing enter in doesn't mean everything in your life stops. You know, yeah, you still have to work and do, do whatever it is you do. We took it a step at a time. We reminded him that we would help him as best we could, but he was under no obligation to follow our advice. We just figured we'd get started and, and give it a shot. Now, have you ever met other people like yourself who've had this same type of thing happen in their sleep? Or are you just one of a kind from what you've, you've met? Well, I never presumed that I was one of a kind because the universe is just too large for that. We are and we're not. I mean, you're the only one of you and I'm the only one of me. But whatever we think of as our uniqueness is probably found somewhere else in the universe besides just us. So, yes, since I've been talking about this publicly, I've had a lot of other people that have told me how this operates in their lives. One lady told me about doing it while she quilts. Well, doing it while she what, Father Nathan? I'm sorry. While she quilts. Oh, really? So wow. Good. Wow. How that for her puts her in an altered state of consciousness or peace, and uh, she, she helps people cross while she quilts. That's what she told me. Has someone ever come to a dream, like, you know, you meet people and you feel really uncomfortable around them? Have you met someone that you, you didn't like or you didn't feel comfortable with, but you, you felt you had to do it anyways? You mean of these afterlife people? Yeah, yeah. You know, like some people, not everyone that's stuck is going to be nice. There could be some nasty characters. Has someone seemed really kind of evil, like a serial killer or something, or someone just not very cool, but you're like, you know what, just like a doctor or whatever, I, I have to help this person? Yes, I've dealt with folk like that, but the ones that come to me are always vetted. I don't go looking for them. They come to me and the Holy Spirit brings them. Okay. You know, spirit means breath. And so the respiration spirit is through the same word. So whenever I, I breathe before going to sleep, I breathe consciously. I ask the Holy Spirit to move in and out of me, to nourish me, because that, that's what your breath does on the way in. It brings in nourishment. And on the way out, it takes out toxin. You off-gas poisons every time you exhale. And, and the Greek word for that is expire. Expire just means to breathe out. So I pray to breathe in goodness and breathe out anything that ought to leave. And no, I've never had any problem with anybody making me be unsafe. Now, you, your process, as we mentioned, it, it is pretty unique, and you've kind of touched on it a little bit, but can you kind of walk us through? So once that first night you see, I guess in video, kind of you, you mentioned it, then you wake up and I assume you take some notes, then you have prayer partners, but you have kind of a, a stable of prayer partners. Can you talk about how you vet your prayer partners? And then when you have that session together, where are you? How long does it take to summon the person before they come? And do you see anything while they're talking to, or is it just auditory at that point? Well, I have probably have had maybe 20 different prayer partners over 22 years or so. I have, I don't even know how many I have right now, maybe about a dozen. I prefer to be in person, but you know, the pandemic has shut down a lot of in-person everything. So I've done many of them over Zoom in the last year and a half, and it works just fine. I look for the qualities in a prayer partner. They need to be good listeners. They need to be compassionate because it's a, it's a healing work. They need to not be astounded or uh, because you work in the paranormal, you know, some there's can be qualities about it that make people, I don't know, just curious or I don't want people being amazed. I, I just want them to be kind. So they, they need to be able to stay in the moment. They need to be not afraid to talk to someone who has died. Uh, and they do need to be a nice human being. That's all. Yeah, this is hard to find sometimes. So, wow, it's great. And you don't just get one stuck soul at a time. I know there's a couple of different stories from your book, which we'll touch on, but do you mind tell us about the conductor from your book that didn't even realize that he was a conductor and you put him on that path? Thank you ask, because we haven't talked about him in a long time. Before I do, you mentioned the word summon earlier, and that one has a kind of a negative valence. I don't summon anybody I invite. Okay. You know, has anybody given you a summons before? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was probably an unpleasant thing. It's kind of like your book, being you know a, a, a Catholic priest, there are certain nuances. Like you can't say the word channel or summon, or even at the end of your book, you're like, it's not a conclusion, it's an epilogue, because it's kind of a different meaning. It's like, you know, it's not like goodbye, it's uh, we'll see you later. So, you know, there's kind of a nuance that's very careful that you have to have. 
I'm a word nerd from way back, even before I became a preacher. I, I did, you know, spelling bees, and I've always loved etymology, and so I pay a lot of attention to to words. That's just a thing of mine. But you mentioned Buddy, who turned out to be the conductor. The, uh, isn't that right? Is that the one you wanted to talk about? Yeah. Yeah, that, he was really fun. In the dream, I was in a car, stopped at a railroad crossing that didn't have a gate or a warning signal. Instead of a succession of box cars, flat cars, tank cars, I watched a string of cars trying to cross train tracks, getting hit by a train. So can you imagine that? Oh, my God. At first, they were from maybe like the 30s, those big rounded cars that were, you know, the style of the time in the 30s. And then as it kept moving, there was crash after crash after crash, but they got closer in time. And sometimes I could see people and other times not. There were two boys in one wreck. There was a little girl with a blue dress and white trim. And then there was a man named Briscoe who wanted first aid. And I, uh, he was a Catholic and he wanted a blessing. Anyway, it went on. But I, I had the feeling when I woke up from it that this one must involve multiple people. Was it a location or was it just the type of accident? Was it, uh, was it like one bad road with a bad turn in the road? Or was it just all these cars because, you know, it's the type of way they died and they're stuck? Yeah, I think it was more the type. I, I, and I've run across this uh, since then with other kinds. Sometimes there are people that cluster according to the traumatic death that they endured. For I don't know why, but they, they are. And in his case, he was out. He was the passenger in a car. He said he, had, he and his buddy had gone out just to have a good time, which meant drink. Yeah. Uh, I think the, guy, the driver might have been drunk. Uh, but anyway, the car, the train hit the car and this guy wouldn't tell me who he was. He had a little bit of an attitude. We were with my older sister in her backyard in Houston, and she's also got the same gift. Both of my sisters do to, of allowing speech. And this time he spoke through my sister. I just said, uh, my name is Nathan. What shall we call you? And he just said, call me buddy. Uh, but he did it with an attitude. <laughs> like he didn't, <laughs> uh, like he didn't, didn't, he didn't want to be friendly. He just was here to do this thing. And he said, these people, they want me to be the conductor. And I'm not the conductor. I never said I'm the conductor. And I said, well, okay, well, tell us, uh, you know, what happened and where you are. And he went on to explain that he was in this place where everybody was stuck. And there was a train track running through the middle of it, but there was a boulder on it and they couldn't get out. So what would you do? Well, you try to get your phone out and get a, some heavy equipment there to, to remove the boulder. I just thought, well, you know, that sounds like stuck all right, but there must be a way. And I believe you. the reason that you're here with me is because we're supposed to help you find a way. So let's get to work. What about like a fulcrum? Could you get something that you could, like some stick, you could get everybody there to you know, throw their weight against it? And he said, it'd be easier if we just had some heavy equipment. I said, good idea. <laughs> have you asked for it? That'd be much better than my way. I said, have you asked for any? You said, no. I said, well, let's start there. Why don't we ask for heavy equipment? And I said, I'm a priest. And so I'm going to say a prayer because that's what I do. And so I said, would it be okay if I, if I asked for heavy equipment? And he said, well, be sure to ask for the key to the ignition. <laughs> and, I, and oh, by the way, if I'm asking for the key to the ignition, maybe I could also ask for a heavy equipment operator just in case it's more difficult to operate than you know how to do. So he said, sure, that's okay. So <laughs> I just said, God, you heard this whole thing. Could we please have a piece of heavy equipment? Could we have the key? And oh, by the way, could we have somebody that knows how to run it? And so within 10 seconds, uh, he just said, oh, my God, look over there. And I said, well, I can't see whatever you're seeing. What is it? Well, he said, it's, it's like a front-end loader. And I said, well, is it yellow? Because a lot of times those you know big pieces of equipment are yellow. He said, yeah, it is. And there's a guy in it, and he's waving for me to come up in the cab with him. So I said, well, do you think you're being tricked? Does it feel unsafe? Do you think you're safe to do that? And he said, no, yeah, it looks fine. I'm going to do it. So he got in. He caught, climbed up in it, and he got at the controls of it. And then he said, and I, I can feel his presence with me right now, Bob. Wow. Uh, he said, uh, oh, my God, look at that. And I said, remember, I can't see what you're seeing. And he said, well, it's like this a great big bubble, and there's people inside of it. And one of them is my papa. And I, and I said, well, does he look scary? No, he just looks like my papa. And I said, well, it sounds like he's come to, to help you. And he said, but they're telling me that I'm supposed to get all anybody that wants to, to join hands and we'll go together. So 
Did you ever do that on the lawn? Like, did you ever like ring around the Rosie or Red Rover or any any kids game where you had to join hands? Sure, I'm thinking like at weddings where it's the train and you're going around. Everybody's like, you know, <laughs> you do the dance around the room. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, we, we anybody that wanted to, nobody was forced, but anybody that wanted to could join hands, and they he would pull and they would or push through this thing, and they would all go together. That's the way it worked. At the end of it, before he left, I said, well, you know, it looks, buddy, it look, he, he had said, you, I would be the last person in the world that you think would be a conductor of anything. Oh. He didn't think highly of his gifts. He only died when he was about 20 and he hadn't been good at school. Huh. And I guess he had a kind of internal message that he wasn't much good at anything. And he, he didn't want to be the conductor. And I said, well, it looks like they're, you're, you pretty much need to say all aboard. <laughs> That's pretty much what a conductor does, I think. You got to get all these people holding hands and lining up and... So he did that and off they went. So you said he just showed up. Does that happen often or much with you where you're talking like on interviews about it or you're at a, you know, you're doing a retreat or something, you're telling a story and the the being shows up? Yeah. I just felt that heart in my uh, left shoulder. Okay. It's no big deal. It's just he, he let me know he's here. Okay. A lot of your stories, I think, were kind of in the United States. I know you get them in English, which it's not like you get you speak in tongues or anything, but you get them in English so you understand them. But one of yours came from, I think, Asia Pacific. Yeah, the tsunami? Yeah. Yeah, that's Ronnie. She was a 12-year-old going on 20. Where was it? What What was the location? She was in Sri Lanka when she died. Sri Lanka, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. We were on holiday, and she was the only child of two very well-educated parents. She was forbidden to go to the beach unaccompanied because she was only 12 and in a foreign place. But it was a Sunday morning. It was beautiful. And her parents were sleeping in when all she wanted to do was go to the beach. So she disobeyed them and went to the beach just in time for that huge tsunami that killed a quarter of a million people to sweep her out to sea. God, you forget that it was like a quarter of a million people. How long ago was it? Do you remember? Christmas in, I think it was 2001, maybe, or... Wow, that was a bad year. And right after... I'm not, I'm not sure on the, yeah. on the date, you know, anybody listen to this to google that it's incredible. Out, but, I mean, you forget how uh, many how many people it was that's an incredible amount of, of death you picked up just on her right yeah and, and in her case even though she died in a in a very large group event this was not about anybody but her she was upset because she had uh, altered the story of her parents life by being the only child and then dying tragically and dying disobediently which really bothered her mm. that kind of that asian respect for parents and grandparents that sort of, yep. and she had disobeyed them as her last act. And that really bothered her. She was upset about that. How many sessions did it take to help her and get her over her guilt and move her across? Only one. The only one that ever took more than one was that first one of uh, Ray, the, the guy that died in a fire on the, on the car, on the hood of the car. Uh, all right. We were learning, what, learning our way forward and learning what we were doing after a while, really after the, the second one. They hardly ever take more than an hour, wow. usually more like 45 minutes. And part of that is just getting acquainted. And how often do you get with your prayer partners? Like bi-weekly, do you tackle two at a time or something? I try to do a two-hour block of when we arrange it. And normally we can do two crossings in that amount of time. I record them on an app on my phone and then get them transcribed. Yeah. I get a Word document, edit just a little bit to clean it up, and then uh, store it away. And then some of them... I don't publicly speak about any unless I've gone back and asked the person's permission to tell their story. I just don't think that it's any of my business to share people's private stuff unless they've given me the okay. And, and how quickly do they get back to you when you ask you like, Hey, I'm writing a book, you know, is it okay to have you? Does it, is it pretty instantaneous or do you have to like wait some time for them to get back? No, I pretty much tell them I'm going to be talking with someone tomorrow and we're going to go into prayer and we're going to be asking for you tomorrow. And what we want to ask is your permission to use your story. So would you please give it some thought and be ready to be called on tomorrow? I just say prayers that are send and not receive. It's not like I'm chatting with the dead every time I say a prayer. Yeah. But I believe they can hear me, especially when I'm focused and I pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I want to be connected, please, to Ronnie, the girl that died in the tsunami. And that's all it takes. Now, what about their survivors here on Earth? Do any of them ever hear about you or hear the stories and contact you and say, that's my sister or that's my ex-husband? You ever have, it, have that happen? I've had it happen uh, once. Once out of like 250, right? Is it roughly how many have you done? I've gone out of my way to, to um, not disclose detail that would give people's identity away. 
Are you familiar with evidential mediumship? You know, I might be, but I'm not sure if our listeners are. So it might be my way of saying I'm not totally familiar. But do you mind kind of educating us on that? Yeah, it's like where they give you the name of their dog or their street address or very specific details that, that clearly identify them as the person and you couldn't have known that. I've tried to stay away from that. I believe the work that I've been given to do is important enough on its own. And I've said to the Lord, if you ever want me to do that other part, you'll only need to say the word if ever you want me to kind of have that prove it sort of thing. But for right now, I've, for the last 22 years, I've been doing this and I believe I'm providing a service. Now, there's one story, if you, if you, I, I don't want to take too many stories from your book. There's one story about a woman, a murder victim, but she didn't want her kids to know that she was murdered, correct? Yes. She worked on a cruise ship as a, a maid uh, uh, on the sh- uh, making beds and stuff on a, on a cruise ship. Her husband had died, leaving her with young children to raise. She was from the Philippines. She thought the best thing she could do was leave her kids with some relatives and go make money on this cruise ship. But on it, she was raped by one of her bosses, uh, whose wife was also on the ship. And the wife knew about the rape and uh, killed her in a way that made it look accidental. Oh, God. Her family knew that she had died on this ship, but they didn't know that she had been murdered. She asked us, uh, what would you do? And and my grandparent partner said, well, really, that's not our place to say (laughs) about you. Uh, we just helped her think her way through. And she said, well, my my children are grown. They have kids of their own. Do they really need to know that I was murdered? Oh, boy. She just decided on her own that she'd rather leave that alone. And so we gave her an assumed name that she supplied. So it's free will, in a sense, still, even even in the afterlife or purgatory, right? It's still free will. It's up to them and how they want to proceed. Or yeah, Her reasoning was that, well, my kids will know that eventually because it's true. But will it make their life better to have that knowledge? Yeah. She just decided they can learn that at a later date, maybe after they die. Uh, I, but she'd rather they uh, just went about their lives and didn't have to have the burden of that. Mm. You know, you, you mentioned, uh, I think I heard somewhere there was a story about a police officer who was shot and killed at his sister's house. And his sister died, too. Yeah. And he was very angry, the police officer. Was was he mad because he wanted to have revenge against the person who killed him? Or what was he? Was he just angry about going so quick or because his sister died? What was his situation? He was angry about a lot of things. He he made a point of saying he, he was shot. He, he saw a spectral version of his sister. And he said, I'd never seen a ghost in my life. And I saw her or her upper body and her hair. But she was agitated. It stopped him in the middle of his workday, and he went to her house. It was a small town somewhere. And on her lawn, he saw men running out of her house cursing her, but he had heard gunshots. And he thought they must have killed her or shot her. And they saw him, and he saw them, and they shot each other. Huh. And one of the one of the three men died on the spot, as did the sheriff, and his sister had been killed earlier. So it was kind of a complicated scene. Did his sister pass on? She wasn't stuck, but he was? I guess so. It didn't really, the way that the story played out, it didn't involve her very much in the end. It was mostly about helping him move along. Yeah. He was just so angry. He said he had never really been that angry in his life. And he was angry at having been made to kill somebody on his way out. The idea that anybody would go into his sister's house and do that. He was supposed to keep the whole town safe. Yeah. And then he couldn't even keep his sister safe. He he was just infuriated. He was red hot angry. And there was something about his anger. He wanted to move along, but he was too angry. And he had coaches in the afterlife saying, we need to get your fever down. Huh. <laughs> we need for some of this rage to uh, calm down some. And then when it came time to choose the possibility of moving into my dream, they said, listen, we're only going to let you do this if you promise us you won't go into that man and get enraged. Yeah. You have to be calm enough to be inside of him, and you need to promise that you'll be a gentleman. And he did that. Was this one session? It was one session. Wow. To work with. He didn't want to give us his name either. He just said, call me sheriff. Yeah. And we did. All he really needed to do uh, was to recognize that he still had needs in the afterlife. They were telling him, We'd like to move you along to the next place that would have the kind of things you need because you've already exhausted in this place uh, all we can do for you. 
So it was really transferring him to a next place where there'd be more resources. And in the end, he wasn't somebody very receptive to counseling. You must know people that would never go to a counselor. Yeah, yeah. Part of their culture, or their family way of doing things. Yeah, I'm not crazy. Only crazy people go to, yeah, whatever, something like that. Yep. Yeah, not kind of thing. Yep. And he was sort of like that. So we said, well, there's got to be somebody that, who's going to come and help you. And it ended up being the founder of the department for which he worked. Huh. You know how most places, many workplaces or schools have some little history wall and on it is the founder or the first graduating class yep. or something like that. Yeah. yeah, He was, he was a picture on the wall that this guy saw when he went into the, into the sheriff's office all the time. And it turned out that guy showed up for him and said, come with me. Huh. This may be an odd question because I, I was in a fraternity in college in uh, a long time ago. And I've heard recently about hazing accidents. Are, have any of the people been like hazing victims or anything like that or weird goofery in college? Yeah, one of those was, I, you know, I, I've been a campus minister most of my life. And so those really bother me when that kind of thing happens. But yeah, one of them was a, a young man who died during a field day. I live across the alley from a fraternity. And I, <laughs> they're here at, at Arizona, University of Arizona, Thursday is the big party night. Yep. Uh, and so Thursday night, the, the party doesn't end until one. Yeah. They shut it down. But anyway, this guy was on on a, a field day. He had to climb a tree as part of this athletic thing and get a flag that was up in the tree and climb back down and hand it to a, a referee or something. And the limb broke. Uh, he fell 10 or 15 feet on his chest and heard something snap. And uh, it was his back. Uh, and Yeah, it's awful. You hear a lot of that. I don't know why I thought of that, but I just it's just... Uh, I don't know. I had something come to me right now. I just thought about that. I don't know. Maybe that person's here. He's become one of my afterlife helpers. Oh, interesting. Sometimes after they go through this, say, you know, you not only helped me, but you introduced me to a world I didn't know existed. I think I'd like to know more about that. Oh. Uh, so he decided that since there seems to be a need for some sort of greeter or crossing guard or whatever you want to call it, somebody that accompanies you and, and keeps you safe as you move. He decided, that guy decided to, uh, Daniel is his name, decided to take that up in the afterlife. You mentioned your, your family, your sister is kind of your prayer group. I think I thought you said, is your family have kind of some, I know you may not call it psychic, but kind of, I don't know, intuitive ability? I call it whatever you want. Out of my, uh, I have two brothers and two sisters. Both my sisters have have different kinds of gifts, but both of them can allow their voice to be used for someone to tell a story. And what do you call that process? You know, I asked my guardian one time and he said, instrumental communication. Interesting. Wow, that's great. Yeah. You're God's instrument and your voice was consecrated. I'm a Dominican and we're the order of preachers and our voice is, uh, is at the heart of our vocation. Yep. Voice is the root of vocation. It's to be called by, by, by a word. So anyway, yeah, it, uh, and then my grandmother had this whole thing going on. She lived next door uh, when I was growing up. Kind of shifting gears a little bit, you see all these things about UFOs or UAPs now, right? And I believe, I thought the Roman Catholic Church accepted the possibility of alien life or life beyond this earth. Do you have any personal thoughts about that? It seems likely to me. For, for, to begin with, I already believe in extraterrestrial life. Before the incarnation, God was not an earthling. Huh. Jesus became an earthling by being incarnate. So God is still an earthling because that wasn't just a short term experiment. I can still talk to Jesus, the human God, because he's both. But it's funny, too, because sometimes these uh, hunting kind of shows presume materiality. Yep. Uh, there must be saucers or little green men or something. There's also beings that can't be seen like angels. Yep. Well, even microbes, we didn't know that they existed until we had microscopes that were powerful enough to observe them. Anyway, I, yes, I believe that there's all kind of other possibilities out there. I live in a world of mystery just like you do. Do you think they have souls and, and that they, they pray or they have the same God that we do? Or I wouldn't have any way of knowing. I, I believe that the one God created all that is, uh, yeah. whatever there is. I don't believe that things just burst into existence on their own out of nothing. I've never witnessed that. Created things seem to come from creators. That, yep. that just makes sense to me. So I don't know. May, I, and I'm wondering, I, upon my death, will I be, begin to meet people that lived on other planets or other life forms? And I'm really not that interested in science fiction, to tell you the truth. Mostly because it seems like a lot of science fiction is war-based, like Star Wars. Right. I have tons of guests, Father Nathan, and like 
One is a person who, who talked about multiple heavens, that there are different flavors of heaven and all this stuff. So I, I don't want to go outside of your belief system, but I mean, I just kind of hear on other shows different things. Of course, recently I've talked to people about UAPs because that's big in the headlines. There's this thing called the Galileo Project with this guy named Avi Loeb, astrophysicist at Harvard. And so long story short, with the report that came out like in June or whatever, that's saying, yes, we have all these sightings these past couple of years. We don't know what it is, but we don't know quite what to call it. And so he's leading up this whole type of initiative of having a series of networks of, of cameras canvassing the sky so that rather than the government or, or hearing from, you know, the Air Force or pilots or things like that, kind of a going more in the private sector to see if they could gather research. So, and it's interesting, if you talk to him about four years ago, he would have no belief in this. And then something called a muamua passed by the sun and it had characteristics of not a comet or an asteroid, but something like debris that would have been made from an extraterrestrial life. And then this stuff happened. So he's found his kind of belief system changing. It's interesting. We live in a crazy time with things happening, which challenges our belief structure. So I just was just curious about that. You're you're listening very respectfully to my wild and woolly stories, and presumably so is your audience. And so I just try to return the favor. I listen to what other people have to say. And it doesn't rock my world to believe that God's created all kind of other beings and people and populated places, planets or invisible worlds that I don't know about. That seems likely to me. We even did it as a child. You look at a starry sky and think we're the only living, <laughs> we're the only little planet in the entire thing that has living beings on it. That didn't make sense to me. Yeah, no, it, it is amazing. What other question? Have you heard from, you know, we talked about the tsunami, the tsunami. What about the Twin Towers on 911? Have you ever had anybody from that incident come back to you? Several times, yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah, one guy that, that, uh, that leapt to his death because that was his best option. Oh, it must have been terrifying. I just to me, that's like one of the most horrible things: seeing people looking out, seeing the fire coming after them, and then jumping out of the building. In his afterlife experience, he he formed in his consciousness. He could either he could have either breathed air that had that was on fire or air that wasn't. Wow! And he chose to breathe the air that wasn't on fire, which was out the window. He allowed himself to fall, but not to land. If you can imagine that. Yeah. And so in his afterlife, he was in a trauma loop of falling, but not landing. And his guardian kept trying to say, his guardian was kind of funny, said, uh, couldn't we please go up instead of down? <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, with people that are in trauma loops, that's a really good technique to get them to, to take a pause. You can go back to that trauma loop in just a minute, but let's take a break. Let's do this other thing. And eventually the guy was ready for the help of somebody like me and uh, someone came for him. I don't remember how that one all played out, but yeah, I've, I've dealt with several. There was one guy immediately after the Twin Towers that showed me a, a bucket. Uh, you're, you're, are you old enough to have gone to the beach with a real metal bucket that wasn't plastic? Sure. Yeah, I'm older than you. I'm 59. No, I'm, I'm 65. Okay. All right. But. Before everything was plastic, you used to take a little metal bucket with a little metal shovel to the beach. Wow. And uh, this guy showed something like that. Maybe it was plastic. Who cares? But he, he showed me an ashtray, and he violently dumped a bucket full of sand in it that was compacted the way it would be when you were, like, building a sandcastle. Mm. And he said, they're not going to find anything of me but the but part of a tooth. And he was, a, he was kind of an Italian gym rat, mm. proud of his physique. And... He wore a lot of uh, muscle shirts with uh, gold chains. <laughs> yeah. He just couldn't believe that his body could go from that to this. And wow. so he, we had to kind of help him figure out what to do. Yeah, leave the materialism and the vanity behind, right? Well, it, it's what we have in our consciousness is so determinative of whatever it is we do. Yeah, I can imagine some people are so tied to their body to the very end. My days of being proud of my physique are well past me. But yeah, I can imagine someone who works so hard on that and just having a hard time letting that go. You must know some people that are just stubborn, bullheaded. Yeah. Create some sort of idea about the world and their place in it. And even if it makes them miserable, that's their story and they're sticking to it. <laughs> Something like that happens when people die or they bring that toward their death over a period of years when their death arrives. They're still stubborn about something. One of the things I've learned is Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth will set you free. Yep. I see that over and over again. People have to tell the truth uh, in order to be able to move. And they only come to me when they've been vetted and are ready to move. But they've had to look at something and either 
change the way they were thinking or recognize that there's a deeper truth in what they were allowing. Could you explain what the vetting process is or do you even know how that works? I don't know what it is other than it's been preceded by, imagine somebody that uh, has been in an awful car accident on a freeway. Somebody shows up that knows what to do and they have the equipment, you know, you might or not be conscious. They get you where you need to be next. That next place, an emergency room has people that know what to do there. Maybe there's then a surgeon that knows what to do. And then maybe I intensive care people. There's all these levels that we have, and there's something analogous on the other side. They don't come to me. My people and I are the discharge staff. So it's like a whole triage system that just kind of works and it just comes to you. They don't come to me until they until others uh, above my pay grade have said, you're ready for this guy. Wow. Well. You were getting ready to gear up for a pretty big release of this. Originally, you're going to do it on November 1st, but probably even more fortuitous, it's going to be in December because, look, everyone's talking December. There's going to be no gifts on the shelves. Well, they can get this for a gift if they order ahead of time. I have a second Afterlife Interrupted book. The first one that you've been quoting from yep. is uh, Helping Souls Cross Over. On the second one, uh, we kept the same graphics, but we put a big number two, calling it book two, and we crossed out the word stuck because we feel like they're not all so much stuck as they are. They were just in a place where they needed more than normal folk because they died uh, violent deaths. So anyway, I did my first live event a a week and a half ago in Phoenix. I live in Tucson. But still, most of this this book release is being done through podcasts in any way that I can make people even aware of it. You're right, because I went on Audible and I got the first one. Give us one maybe notable quick story from the new one and explain how it's a little bit different and even better and then where they can order the book, how they can order the book. Uh, one that people are really responding to is one that I call Lucille Come Under Fire. This lady woke up in the middle of the night, like 3.30 in the morning, looking out her window to see all kind of colors that looked beautiful that she'd never seen before. Well, it was a wildfire. Her neighborhood was on fire and she was in it. Wow. Uh, once she realized what it was, she sized things up and thought, I'm in my 80s. I'm in a house coat and slippers. My chances to get to the car and out of here are <laughs> not very good. <laughs> she decided I could I could go out and I could run out into a fire or I could stay here and hope it passes over. Yeah. You read about that. You know, tornadoes and f- wildfires sometimes skip around. So she gathered up her cats and said, come sit by me. Come sit in my lap. We're going to wait this out. And she said, um, I wasn't burned. She said, I don't know how wildfires work, but I think the air was empty. There was no oxygen in it. The fire ate it all. Yeah. And that she was, she went unconscious and she said her guardian got her up and out of the place. And even though her body eventually burned, she wasn't in it and taking part in that. We call her Lucille Calm Under Fire because she was just so rational about it. It's surprised that she was stuck, though, because she was so rational about it. You know, you would think that she wouldn't be stuck in the afterlife. Well, that's why we covered the word stuck in the second one. It, she really wasn't stuck. She had just needed extra rest. Okay. And she got the rest that she needed. She regained some composure. And she hadn't been looking forward much because she was an elderly widow who didn't make plans for much of anything. So one of the things she had to do was kind of start over as a planner or somebody that could anticipate future good and choose it. So she took a little while to do that. And part of that was, well, you're, you're ready to move. We need to, you need to choose a way to, you need a companion or choose somebody that can get you moving. And she chose me. Is it also going to be an audible book? I know you did the voiceover for your first book, which I listened to, which you know is good because usually if someone does their voiceover, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out so well. It's like, they're not as good, but it's like, you actually have a good voice for telling these stories. So it was good. It was pretty easy to listen to. Both of the books are, are uh, available on audible.com and iTunes, or wherever you get audible. I mean, I get mine on Amazon audible, audible, but yeah, they're, they're available there. And then I was laughing about it, but um, I have inventory. So if you're trying, if you're Christmas shopping for stuff and it's in a boat off the coast of California, I, I have books right here in my house. And anybody that wanted to come through my website and order one, I could send them a, a signed copy if they wanted that for, for themselves or a gift. Can you uh, give us the website? Yeah, my website is my name. It's Nathan Castle. So it's N A T H A N dash C A S T L E dot com. Nathan dash Castle dot com. And you're also on Facebook? Yeah, if you go to the website, up on the upper right are the icons for 
Facebook. The YouTube channel is really good right now. I've worked on that a lot during the pandemic. It used to just be my grandmother's attic, you know, just a dump for video. <laughs> And now it's it's pretty well organized. I teach courses and they're all on the YouTube channel. So if you go on the website and go up to the upper right, uh, the icons are there for Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. What about a course about this? Do you have a course about your series at all, about uh, what you do? After I did the first book, I created an online video series that I tried to sell as a course and it really wasn't selling very well. I just decided to start releasing it for free on YouTube. So any listener can go on there and, and find the, it's called the companion video series. It's just me talking to a camera, explaining things that come up. I did a kind of a, what do you call those? A focus group. Yeah. After I, uh, I got 75 people to read book one and then I got them together for three hours and said, what questions came up? And I took all their questions and I turned them into a video series. Oh, wow. That's great. Well, you put the work in father. That's, that's, that's for sure. Hey, one last question. I have to ask you about this. You did another book called Toto to the Wizard of Oz as a spiritual adventure, right? So a lot of people may think of like Frank Baum's book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, upon which the movie was based. Some people may or may not know is it was put out there that it was like a political allegory for American politics right around the dawn of the 20th century. You know, Dorothy is a Kansas innocent. Yeah. She represents kind of the nobility of Midwestern America. You get the Tin Man, he's industry. You get the Scarecrow. I guess that's agriculture. I'm not quite sure what the lion is, but- how do you interpret The Wizard of Oz from a spiritual vantage? I think of it, uh, I think of Toto as the Christ. He's the, the God who's present with you all the time, whether you're in a real world or a, a, an unreal one. The, the great big story of our lives is returning to where we came. Mm -hmm. And I use that story as a way to help people examine gently where they are in their life. Do they like the place they are? Would they rather be somewhere different? I've done a lot of in-person retreats with them, and it gives me great joy. I brought it to places where there have been horrific death from tornadoes and help people regroup and use that story and its tornado as a way of thinking what happened here and, and were there any blessings in the midst of all this uh, this death and destruction. So anyway, that book is really fun, too. And I love, uh, Dorothy uh, was, you know, was played by Judy Garland. Her 100th birthday is coming up in June. Oh. I'm hoping to go to her hometown of Grand Rapids, uh, Minnesota and offer something there, maybe in advance of it, kind of a retreat or something. Anyway, anybody that loves The Wizard of Oz, find that book. And uh, if you, you bring me to your town, I love nothing more. I'm doing one of those retreats in a small church in Phoenix coming up in December, yeah. where I just use it as a way of talking about life. Thank you for being on the show. I wish you luck on this book, and I will put links in the show notes. But fascinating stuff that you do. You're one of a kind of all the guests so far that, that has this kind of capability and does so much good. So I, I appreciate you sharing it with us tonight. I enjoyed being with you. You're good at what you do. Thank you. You've been listening to the Afraid of Nothing podcast. Please subscribe and like us on Facebook. Until next time, stay scared. Hey, you're still here? Great. Then why not listen to another episode? Visit afraidofnothingpodcast.com to peruse all the shows. That's afraidofnothingpodcast.com. And while you're there, Click the coffee cup icon to buy me a coffee and leave a review. I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming episode. And the world will know how swell you are.